just in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold's question before the short term, we've got copies of um, the skeleton argument, our closing skeleton argument at first instance, which my learned junior is handing up. And at paragraphs 96 and 100, which are on pages 32 and 33, um, the argument is put forward um, in relation to irritation specifically. Um, so I'll just wait till we... Page 32, top of page 32, paragraph 96. Um, Sorry, I only go up to page 24. Oh, that's a disaster, my lady. Then Let's hand up another copy and see if we can do better. You'll be missing the critical part. Yes, that's <laughs> good, is it? Do my lords have the correct? Yes, I do. Oh, that's good. Yes, so do I. Well, so I won't take it personally. Oh, good. So, paragraph 96. So just wait. Can I go back one the right number of pages? Better. It's the pe uh, pretty close to the back. Um, page thirty-two. There's no data. The paragraph ninety-six. There's no data in which ocular irritation has been tested. Then there's a reference to the cross-examination passage, which I took um, my lady and my lords to. And then over the page, um, paragraph one hundred, top of page thirty-three. There are three bullet points. The third one is it's not possible to tell whether fluprostanol causes the irritative side effects which are a principal concern to the skilled person. And just because it may also be of interest and relevant to, relevance to the court on this point, if my lady and my lords take up um, the core bundle at tab 8, there's the further argument in relation to permission to appeal and the judge's reasons for refusing permission, which said, shed some light on where um, the learned judge is coming from on this point. So it's tab 8, page 139, paragraph 16, where the learned judge says, there is, in my view, not even arguably an inconsistency between my finding of obviousness, obviousness and insufficiency, because I held as a matter of fact that the patent did render a useful effect on my being plausible, and irritation was not run as part of the claimant's technical contribution. So... Uh, I was hypothesising before the short adjournment as to why the judge had made the error that he did. Sorry, it's page 139, bottom of the page. Uh, and I, I, this backs up what I said, which is he, uh, the learned judge, thought it wasn't relevant because it wasn't part of the te claimant's technical contribution, it wasn't run as part of the claimant's technical contribution. And I say that evidence is the error of law that I say the judge has made which is that it doesn't matter what the claimant says is the technical contribution, we've got to look at the patent uh, and see uh, what it means to say that the invention works. Uh, I'm going to sit down now and let's... Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Hall, over to you. Um, may I please the court. My learned friend at the outset of her submissions candidly recognised the hurdle facing an appellant on an obviousness appeal uh, from a judgment on obviousness. The submissions made orally to this court come down to the main points that the judge misread Sternchance in two respects. First, as regards the impression Sternchance gives regarding hyperemia and second as regards the direction of research taught by Sternchance. And of course we originally had also the insufficiency squeeze which I'll deal with separately and to which are now added the question of the issue of the leader, the leader of the pack and does that make any difference and whether the pharmacologist gave evidence on the basis of the wrong common general knowledge. Now I will address my submissions accordingly uh, and with that focus, I won't address the court on the rafts of other matters raised in my learned friend's skeleton. Um, for example, there are the alleged errors in each of the six factors in paragraph 177. There are also the significant problems the judge saw in the defendant's approach at a paragraph 186. Those are attacked root and branch too. Now, I'm assuming that they're dropped, but if not, I will stand on my written... Uh, submissions, if I may. Uh, the first is dealt with from paragraph 68 onwards. The latter is dealt with in paragraph 186. 
is a paragraph 85 onwards. And there's no doubt that those were far and beyond questions of principle, errors of law. They were engaging a wholesale reappraisal of the factual and evidential record, which is not the function of, of these proceedings. Now, uh, with that basic introduction, um, in our respectful submission, the judgment under appeal is a careful, considered, multifactorial assessment of inventive step in the light of the evidence before the judge, and he came to the right conclusion on, on the facts. When one reads the judgment, as the court will have done, carefully I, I know, from paragraphs 172 to 196, it's compelling why the judgment on, on, on the appeal against the finding of obviousness should be dismissed. There's nothing in the specific points of criticism, and in brief, the appellant alleges the judge misread Sternschanz in two respects, and I'll come to them specifically in a minute. But I think as the court has already picked up, it doesn't go anywhere, and they're insufficient to allow this appeal. And if my, the court would take the judgment at paragraph 188, We have the significant problems in 186, and notably the criticisms of those are now dropped, although they are pursued in, in, in the skeleton. And four and five were that no case was made that fluproxenol would be specifically identified, and five was uh, that in particular it would be thought, for reasons explained, the better IOP lowering effect would be accompanied by more hyperemia. But and I'm going to address the court in a minute, in 187, they say even if they had the skilled team thought of trying fluprost on animals to assess its possible use to treat, they were regarded as very uncertain what effect it would have. And I'm going to come to that because there was more evidence on which that finding was based than just the reading that my learned friend relies upon. And I'll come to that in a second. But the crux of it is this. At 188, but in any event, bearing points 1 to 3 in mind, which, as I say, are now no longer challenged orally, in the context of overall direction of Schoenstatt, I don't think the skilled team would, without invention, have turned its mind to fluoroprostol as a possible treatment in the first place. Even if it did, the prospects would be very uncertain. Much And, and having regard to efficacy and side effects, and I'll show the court some of the evidence on that, much more attractive options consistent with the overall teaching and direction of Chen Chance were available. The in any event leads to the conclusion that even if there was something in the point at the end, tail end of five in 186, that can't overcome the judge's in any event finding that he would not find fluprostanol obvious. So it's a cul-de-sac so far as actually getting over um, the, the judgment uh, is concerned. Now, the judgment, uh, as I'll show the court, is a holistic evaluation of the evidence, and not just the evidence that my learned friend has shown the court. And I was introduced only just recently to the expression of island hopping in a sea of evidence. I don't know where it comes from. Lewis and LJ. <laughs> it's a very eloquent uh, saying, and, and that's the danger of showing snippets of the evidence. I'll show, I'll show the court a specific example of that danger in, in just a minute. Where the judge has actually come to a conclusion that is a reasoned assessment of the facts, uh, as is cited in our footnote uh, on 9 on page 24 from the Arab Insurance Group case, it's to be treated as akin to a matter of, 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 of discretion. And even though an appellate court might come to a different view uh, on the same basis, has the judge actually gone wrong in a way which is manifestly wrong or unreasonable? Now. Two of the new grounds of appeal that are introduced by the amendment are first the argument in paragraph 13 of their skeleton that the judge failed to take account the fact that the pharmacologist is the leader of the team. And the second is that the pharmacologist's evidence in respect of Sternschatz, that's our evidence, respondent's evidence, should be rejected in its entirety because it was based on the wrong CGK. Now I will again demonstrate there's nothing in either of those points, but it's easy to see why the appellants are compelled to run those arguments. First, 
they have to sideline completely the evidence of the medicinal chemist because the evidence of the respondent's medicinal chemist pointed powerfully away from what the appellants say was the obvious course to follow. We give the references, and I'll come to some of them in a, in a moment, where the medicinal chemist was saying, no, I don't think going to fluprostanol is the most straightforward way. I think the most straightforward way is actually to make analogues or structural variations of the compounds in Stjancha. Now, he was only saying it was the most straightforward way. Actually, both of the uh, respondents' experts didn't think either course had any reasonable prospect of success. But saying that, well, the pharmacologist said that it would have no reasonable prospect of success looking at compounds doesn't mean that ergo it follows that fluprostanol becomes obvious because that was not the most straightforward way. So when the most straightforward way is not obvious, it doesn't make fluprostanol obvious. And the reason that they seek to exclude Dr. Krauss's evidence altogether, saying that he didn't consider the position based on the right CGK, which as the judge included fluprostanol, and, and we say that is wrong. And I'll come to it again in a moment, because Dr. Krauss in reply and the judge specifically holds in an early part of the judgment, I think it's 15, 7, 18, he said, yes, Dr. Krauss did deal with the CGK as it was being advanced by the appellants in his reply report, but he said he didn't see anything tactical or wrong in that, and he wasn't going to discount that evidence on that basis. So he did, actually, and I'll come to it, uh, show you. Now, the final point I would flag up, just uh, as a prefatory point, is the question of expectation of success. Because when one reads paragraph 74 and 75 of their skeleton, the appellant's skeleton, it has some very brave submissions. It submits that there was a good prospect that this, the receptor antagonism of fluprostanol would bring reduced side effects, even though other factors could be contributing to the side effect profile. And they say in 75, that the skilled team would know of fluprostanol as the prime example, it would be the obvious choice to test with a reasonable expectation of success, both in respect to IOP lowering and reduced side effects. Well, the evidence that my learned friend took the court to this morning doesn't come close to supporting those two statements in its appellate skeleton argument. Could the court just take first supplemental bundle at tab five for Dr. Redshaw, at paragraph 72. In my opinion, the most straightforward approach, and that most likely to lead to early success, would have been to test PGF analogs to be reported uh, like latanoprost. High affinity and good sensitivity with other prostanol receptors. Those pharmacologic properties are in mind much more important to achieve the target profile. Well, saying that something is more likely to lead to early success is not an assessment of, at all of what the prospect of success actually is. Everything is relevant. And can I also, just while we've got this page open and don't have to go back to it, deal with another point that my learned friend made. She said, well, there was no evidence that you would want to make uh, analogues. And 73, if the court would go to 73, says in terms, if such an analog had not already been described, it would have been necessary to prepare new analogues and test their potency and selectivity. It would have receded uh, more resources. And then if I could ask the court to go to Dr. Wilson's report at tab six, this is the reply ref uh, expert report. First at 144. He says, in my opinion, fluprostanol will be the first compound to be tested. The fact it was highly potent selected would enable a relatively low concentration of use, thereby minimising the risk of any unwanted side effects. Again, everything is relative. Talking about minimising uh, the risk of unwanted side effects is actually a very inadequate assessment of what you would think the prospects of, of success would be. And as I indicated to the court, when the judge says in paragraph 180, as an example, 
even if it did, the prospects of success having regard to efficacy and side effects would have been very uncertain. Now, as Lord Hoffman said in Bargen, a statement of judgment by even the most meticulous judge is inadequate. You can't sum up all the evidence. It's a holistic assessment. And can I give an example of that? Because there was evidence to support that very uncertainty. Uh, and again, to, to ask the court to go to the supplemental bundle, a uh, tab one, a uh, paragraph 164.3, which is on page 13. In fact, to make sense of it, can I pick it up at page 12? Because at 164.1, there's an illustration of latanoprost, which is the best compound 5 in Sternschatz. And there's an illustration of fluprostol isopropyl ester. Uh, and the court will see that the differences are there's a, a double bond in the omega chain, the chain along the bottom. These are highlighted, I hope they're highlighted in yellow in the court's copy. And there's an oxygen group that turns the phenyl group into a phenoxy group, and there's a trifluoromethyl group on the on the on the on the on the ring. And what then um, the the uh, witness says at 164.3, Dr. Kavala, and he's 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 asking himself, is it obvious to have those differences? over latanoprost. And he says, in this respect, if anything, it's 164.3, the commentary, the data and commentary in Stern Chance would dissuade the skilled medicinal chemist from making these modifications. Firstly, when adding the trifluoromethyl group and the phenyl rings, Stern Chance suggests that making bulky substitutions in the three and four positions and adding electron donating of drone groups such as trifluoromethyl and the phenyl ring decreases predicted IOP activity significantly. In fact, it was reduced almost altogether according to Stern Chance. Further, in considering whether to restore the 13-14 double bond of PGF to alpha, Stern Chance reports the modification seems to result in a worse, slightly worse profile from the perspective of hyperemia, see above. And then if I could ask the court to go to his reply report at uh, tab three, comes back to this, paragraphs 36 and 37. And he says at 36, there's no definitive way for the skilled medicinal chemist to predict how these structural modifications would affect the pharmacological profile of fluprostanol and suitability for the treatment of glaucoma. However, the structural activity data disclosed in Chernchats would suggest the following. The substitution of the phenyl ring shows that no substitution of the phenyl ring resulted in improvement in arctic activity relative to unsubstituted compounds. Indeed, most of the substitutions result in a decrease of myotic activity, particularly the case for the trifluoromethyl substituted in Table 4 of Chernchats. The paragraph 1216 of my first report, I note the skill of the would therefore likely avoid bulky substitutions of the three and four position and also electron donating withdrawing groups. Fluprostanol contains a CF3 substituted phenyl ring, and as CF3 is bulky electron withdrawing group, the skill medicinal chemist would therefore predict it to be less efficacious at lowering IOP than an anaprost where sub substitutions reduced activity. Of the double bond, he says presence may increase hyperemia. Of the inclusion of the oxygen atom, there are no compounds tested in Schoenschanz contain oxygen. However, it's clear from Schoenschanz that the hydroxy group of carbon-15 of PGF2 is important in maintaining IOP. Replacing carbon-17 with an oxygen atom would likely result in hydrogen bonding between the hydroxyl group of carbon-15 and inserted oxygen. This could disrupt the function played by the 15-hydroxy group, which is important for the pharmacological activity of lanotanoprost. So one can see with such evidence how the judge is entirely right to say it would be very unclear if you were to try fluprostanol. And in fact, to Dr. Kavala, it would have been clear that it would have been worse in material respects had you decided to test it. Because you wouldn't test it not knowing what the difference was between fluprostanol uh, and latanoprost. And, and what's clear is that the references to very uncertain, both in 187 and 188, are based on much more material that was before the judge than just the statement which the judge is alleged to have misread about hyperemia and IOP uh, being somehow uh, correlated. And I make that point to make the submission that it is really dangerous uh, in, in this court to go island hopping uh, on the evidence uh, uh, and not to see that the judge's 
uh, judgment was a holistic assessment based on, on, on all the evidence. Now, another significant aspect which the judge placed weight on is that Dr. Wilson notably failed to deal, actually, with why the skilled team would think of fluproxenol in the first place. It was all a bit of a mystery. And this was an important omission because the court is very wary of the issue of hindsight. And that's why, following the judgment of Miss Justice Mead recently in Fisher and Paykal and Flexicare, experts should not only explain how they reach their conclusions, how did they find fluproxenol and the rest of it, but what steps they are taking and have taken to avoid hindsight. So actually giving a, an explanation as to how fluproxenol came into the equation was somewhat important. Neither expert did so. In fact, there was a rather surreal aspect where Dr. Redshaw, in her evidence in chief, said, I've been asked to assume that the medicinal chemist has been asked to test fluproxenol. And she said in cross-examination, she, she thought she'd got it from somewhere. Um, and there was, there was going to be a long section in her expert report as to how it came about. Uh, but that long section had been chopped out by the lawyers and hadn't made it into Dr. Wilson's report either. So it was, again, always something of a mystery. But the judge was right to say that really how fluproxenol comes into play is something the experts should have done, uh, and they didn't do. And, and the reference to where Dr. Redshaw just being asked to assume the skilled person would want to test fluproxenol is paragraph uh, 75. And, and the judgment also finds, in the same paragraph 191, where I've just mentioned, that Dr. Redshaw, had considered stern chance only rather briefly. Now, you can look at the reports where the medicinal chemist from Dr. Kavala from the respondent took the paper for what it was worth and analysed it. And Dr. Redshaw, on the other hand, didn't. She has one, I think, two paragraphs. And those two paragraphs, um, if, if, if one takes Schoenstatt, where towards the end of, of the Stern Chants, uh, on page 173 of the bundle, page 701 of the reference, on the right hand side of the, uh, the right hand column, um, it had in the second full paragraph introduction of a trifluoromethyl group into position four in the phenyl ring, as can be expected, render the 17 phenyl practically inactive. And that's a reference to the table on the other side, table 4, where compound number 23 has introduced a trifluoromethyl compound. And it basically became inactive um, in the pupil diameter. Um, compound 5 reduced it by minus 9.7, whereas compound 23 was minus 0 0.5. And that's the basis on which Dr. Kavala was making a statement earlier, that putting a bulky substituent onto that phenoxy ring um, uh, was shown by Sternschatz to basically render it inactive. And the classic dictum, I forget which case it's from, and Edmund or Justice Arnold will know, um, it was said, I think it was only Matheson, that there is no prevision in chemistry. You, you can't say that by... Yeah, you have to view that statement in its technological era, which was the 1960s. <laughs> in, indeed. Now, but actually, nowadays, with computational chemistry, there's a lot more can be done. But of course, we have to view this through the evidence as to the state of the art in 1993. And what Dr. Kavala would take from this, that putting a bulky constituent, a substituent on that, would, yeah. would basically reduce activity in the way it should. So all I'm saying is that the judge had ample evidence on which to say prospects were very uncertain. Um, and, and then I'll come, come back to that perhaps. And what's very clear on the face of the evidence, is that the appellants had, and still have, a very selective approach to Stjernschaft. They rely upon those parts that suit them about receptor activity, but where they uh, don't like it, for example, about the trifluoral group, they denigrate it. And the judge made the comment that actually the criticism they make of the hyperemia going, being correlated in some way, that criticism was very inconsistent with their general thrust that this was a high quality paper and there was a degree of looking both ways in that respect. Now 
Mr. Walker, can I just check the paragraph you showed us from Stern Shantz with its reference to an introduction of a trifluoral methyl group yes. into position four in the phenyl ring? Is that what you would have to do if you're going to use fluprostanol? It is substituted. It has a bulky trifluoromethyl substitution. Here. And in the same place? I'm not sure it's exactly the same place. It's on the ring. But I'm not, I wouldn't say it's... I think it might be in the author rather than the meta position, but I'll be correct on that. And the evidence um, which is actually cited and, uh, yeah, yeah, by it's, the... It's it, in Luprostanol, it's the five position, I think. So it's one, one round. Yes. yes. I think that's right. I don't think that would have any influence on its electron withdrawing uh, donating properties. Um, I think the electron cloud that's buzzing over that phenyl ring would be similarly affected wherever it was, but I'm slipping it slightly outside my field. But no, that's the, to Dr. Kamala's evidence was that he could draw that assessment from the statement in Schoencher. And it's why Dr. Redshaw, it was the only, it was the only bit of turn chance that Dr. Redshaw, their medicinal chemist, actually commented on. <laughs> it was quite, quite remarkable that she only thought the only bit she should address is the bit that rather appeared to hinder the, the case of, of obviousness. Now, I mean, I don't think it matters, but the focus of the paper is actually on steric hindrance due to it being bulky. And that's one of the points that the witness made, but then he added the fact that it's electron withdrawing, which is not mentioned in Sternschanz, but of course would be known to the skilled reader. I think my lord is right, but I, I think also it doesn't influence the fact that it would be equally bulky, and, and the size would hysterically would be the same. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's not just the size, it's the, the, the position of it, which is why it doesn't matter if it's in the two position, because that's pointing away from the hydroxy group, which is where, what you're concerned about. Whereas what you can say is, well, if you advance from the four position to the five position, that's closer to the hydroxy and therefore more steric hindrance. Yes. Well, but anyway, these are all points for evidence. They are points for evidence, and they were made in evidence by Dr. Kavala. And, and uh, as I say, the two paragraphs that my own friend pointed on, expectation of success, didn't grapple with any of this. It was superficial in the extreme and the judge so comments and, and rightly so and there's no uh, appeal against that. Um, can I ask the court um, since we are on this particular question because there are two passages of evidence that the, they were the high water mark of the evidence before the judge and they're the high water mark in the sense that my learned friend quotes them again in paragraph 73 of, of her skeleton. And one of the things the judge made clear is that it was important to view those uh, extracts in their context and as a whole. And in paragraphs 94, 95, and 96, we set out references where it's necessary to see the entire context. And time and again, Dr. Kavala made his position very clear that Table 3 of Sternschanz did not give any assistance on the question of having a compound that was effective and avoided the issues with PGF2-alpha. And we give the references in paragraph 94. And, and could I just highlight, ask the court to highlight, Day 3, 41611 to 4172. In fact, I think sidelining them is the best thing. Can Shall I, we turn those off? Yes, can I? ask the court to go to supplemental bundle at tab 10 for day 3 and the pages I would just refer to are 395 on page 112 And 400 
lines 2 to 16. 401, 15 to 19. And all of this was in the context that you would basically be pursuing uh, fluprostanol because it had been identified as, as, as selected. Shall we quickly read through those passages? Um, yes, certainly. T taking the last one, I think... Um, page 395. So in other words, if I were looking as, as a medicinal chemist, I wouldn't say, oh, I need this receptor profile in order to get the desired side effect profile. What Stern-Shanch does say is that FP receptors are involved in the reduction of intraoperative pressure Okay, fine, but so is PGF12 for involved in reduction of intraocular pressure. The question of medicinal chemists how to avoid side effects has clearly been done with the Tanaflos, but ascribing to a particular receptor profile is, I believe, not possible or logical thing to do. And then, if I could ask the court to go to 401, page 113, at lines 15 to 19. If you want to pursue the receptor based approach to that, then this is interesting, but there's no association between those functional effects and the receptors involved, potentially involved in those side effects. And then the same effect at 409. And I think more importantly, can I pick it up at 416, 117? And this is where it was being put squarely to him that fluprostanol is what you would do. The seven, in particular, the first one you would test is fluprostanol because it is the paradigm example of a selective FP receptor. I think looking backwards, that may seem to be an obvious thing to do. At the time, one's confronted with a conjectural statement in this paper. And the question for the medicinal chemist is how to improve the side effects both hyperemia and irritate. It may be that a compound which lacks affinity of efficaciousness of prostaglandin receptor subtypes unidentified ones is good from the perspective of irritation but it's necessarily insufficient characteristic for treatment of glaucoma. One needs to also to avoid the hyperemic effects to generate a compound for a patient to use it one day. So the conventional approach which medicinal chemist um, the conventional approach which a medicinal chemist will adopt in those circumstances is say we have a profile with a compound of latanoprost, let us see if we can take this little bit further by modifying its structure. That's what I would do. So when it gets out there, published structure available, you know it's efficacious, why would Fluprostol not be at the top, the very top of your list of compounds to test over this paper. I just don't get it. I don't understand why fluprostol would not be top of your list. Well, it, well it, comes from a compl it comes from a completely different area of endeavour. It may be described as highly potent and selective in the context of the treatment of estrous cycle in mares, but taking it across to different species by different route of administration and different tissue, I wouldn't necessarily agree the obvious potent and selective agent, a good agent for the treatment of glaucoma. Dr. Cavallo, I have to be critical of you in giving that answer, and then we have a bit of a dialogue. Um, and then at page 419, this is uh, four, starts at 418, line 24. I think what you're trying to put to me is a medicinal chemist would use a pharmacological argument for transferring the utility and then utility of fluprostanol in one area to another. I'm just pointing out that a medicinal chemist, their bread and butter is structural variation. Confronted with this particular reference, turn chance, what the way you would the way you would go is by modifying the tanoprost rather than shifting over a different area entirely and expecting the transference of all those properties into a different species, a different root and a different tissue. So this was very much the evidence you just don't go to fluprostanol, you do the variations on the compound. And I think uh, there are there are further references to that effect. Yes, we've um, got the confusion about mares and cows in the next page. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it was horses. I see I had sold... Yeah, well, it was. It was mares, but... Um... Yeah. Um, and, and it comes back to this. This went on for a long time. Page 422, line 14. Dr. Turner, now I don't understand why you wouldn't test fluprostanol, which you know to be a potent FP antagonist. You, you would make new molecules and test them when you don't know whether they're selective FP antagonists or not. What you do is you start off by making relatively small modification of the and you would investigate the effects of different substitution patterns around the ring. You would investigate the effects of heteroatoms in the chain. I mean, they talk about it at the end, and we'll come to see that. They say they've made compounds with rather than a phenyl, phenyl group at the end, cyclohexane and so on. So it's clear that the chance group have deployed exactly what I'm advocating, which is further modification of the to see where you go. They've not immediately latched on to pond fluprostanol. 
Yeah. Well, then, well, Mr. Watt, you keep on showing us evidence references which are all to the same effect, namely that what medicinal chemists do is they make small structural variations. Well, we know that. I mean, that's 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 the nature of their job. Absolutely. But it doesn't actually answer the case that the appellants are making. The case the appellants are making is the leader of the team is a pharmacologist, and their pharmacologist um, knows from his common general knowledge that um, fluprostanol um, is uh, active against the FP receptor, and then you've got the information that you add to that from Sternschatz. Yes. Um... Um, and, and so really, looking at it from the appellant's perspective, the, the medicinal chemist is almost irrelevant. Well, that is now. That, you might say that's a flaw in their case, but simply say, showing us lots of evidence to the effect that medicinal chemists do what medicinal chemists do doesn't answer it. Fair point, Lord. Because um, I say it does answer it because the skilled chemist is not redundant in this exercise, and there is no force in this leader. And that's a useful segue to go on to this point about the leader of the team. And as I said when I introduced this just uh, this morning, that being the leader of the team just means that the pharmacologist possesses the necessary understanding of the relevant disease target, as to say glaucoma in this case, and was familiar with the biological assays associated with the disease. That doesn't detract in any way, we say, from the role of the skilled medicinal chemist, whose task is to make compounds to test against the target. The idea that the pharmacologist is the leader of the team doesn't exclude that task and that role of the medicinal chemist. And that's why when Mr. Just the Lord Justice Jacob in Halliburton said, each member of the team is assumed to play his or her part in that team. And I think it's necessary to see exactly what the evidence was as regards the makeup of the team. We actually cite it in paragraph 18 of our skeleton. If, if the court can have that to hand. It was Kavala's first report at paragraph 16. Four lines down, in bold, it's the pharmacologist who would identify the biological target for potential new drug. The role of the medicinal chemist would then be to identify with the pharmacologist new chemical compounds to synthesize as potential candidates to act as that biological target, and then to design and perform the syntheses of these compounds. The pharmacologist would then design the assays to test the chemical compound synthesized and to determine whether that compound was likely to be a good candidate for further development. That is the way that it operates. The pharmacologist knows more about the disease. The medicinal chemist knows about compounds, and that's how the two uh, work together. The roles were very clear, and that accorded, actually, with the evidence of Dr. Redshaw, and the evidence of Dr. Krauss we cite in paragraph yeah, well, 19. See, this, this takes me on to a question I wanted to ask you, because it, it relates to the point you were just making about you can't simply sideline the medicinal chemist. Now, of course, picking up the way it's expressed in Dr. Kavala's evidence, if the compound already exists, you don't need to synthesize it. And in one sense, it could be said, well, that's the advantage of something like you don't have to go out and figure out how to synthesize it because it's already been made. So it may be available off the shelf from a, a specialist supplier, even if it's not available off the shelf from a specialist supplier, there's a known synthesis already, so you don't have to spend time, effort and money figuring out how to synthesize it. Um, so it could be said, well, from that perspective, the role of the um, medicinal chemist is minor, shall we say. But I suppose your answer to that, I'm assuming, is, well, that was never the way the case was put. Correct. But also it's important to note that the, the medicinal chemist, that's even assuming that it is put that way, the fluprostanol is brought in by the pharmacologist who says, here's a pot of fluprostanol. The medicinal chemist is going to look at what fluprostanol is from the Merck Index and is actually going to see that what has been done in Sternschatz, which was the obviousness reference, is the phenyl ring per se had had this effect and also that uh, this particular length with the um, uh, double bond, sorry, the, without the double bond in the ring, would say, look, Sternschatz's group has gone beyond just, just 
Right. Yeah, so, so as I understand it, that's the relevance of the evidence you were showing us earlier, which is that your submission is that, putting it in my own words, is that even if you go down that route, you can imagine a, a dialogue between pharmacologist and chemist, in which the pharmacologist says, well, I see from this that the FP receptor is important. I know that fluprostanol is um, active against the FP receptor. What do you think about that? To which the medicinal chemist says, ah, well, that's jolly interesting, but look at the structure and look at what Sternchance tells me about the structure activity relationship. Yes, and I wouldn't ex I would expect it to be worse. That's precisely what Dr. Kavala said. And I, I forget, I don't have my hand on the exact reference, but I, one of the bits of cross examination, the, the witness said, well, why would I take a step backwards? They would perceive Prostanol as a step backwards because Sternchance was an acknowledged leader in the field. He was also the co author in the other paper. Uh, whose name I forget, um, Carlson. And he was also the editor, I think, with Beto of a, of a major book. I mean, this, this, this was the leader of the pack producing the leading results. Um, and that's why, basically, just to say, well, in hindsight, you can see fluprostanol might be a way to go. Actually, confronted with the data you've got, it's, it's not. And that's why the judge was saying it would be, be very un un uncertain. Now, the other aspect of the, of the appellant's point. Can I, can I ask you, Mr. Wood, as a matter of law, how much expectation of success do you have to have before it's worth trying something? It's a factor. It's one of the parts of the multifactorial exercise, and it was addressed in, in Seattle. It's not the be all and end all of everything. But unless you have some expectation of success, and the EPO says, you know, it's just not enough to be obvious to try. <laughs> everything is obvious to try in the abstract. Uh, but unless there's a good reason to think that you're going to get something better, a motivation, improved product, then, then, then you wouldn't do it. Thank you. So it's a fact-specific question, how much expectation of success is material in the context of the case. Yes, and, and the judge, in his multifactorial exercise, just says, you know, the evidence of the uh, appellants was, was superficial. I forget which paragraph it is. And he said, look, it would be very uncertain. Um, and doing something with that uncertainty, and that's also before you get to his finding on 188, that it was inventive actually to think of fluprostinol for the reasons he gives in 180, 186. And actually taking something from a different context in itself can be inventive. That's what the judge has, has said in this, this, this case. Now, the next point was, and this is, my Lord Lord Justice Arnold picked up on this a, a moment ago, that they were putting in Dr. Krauss as the leader of their case, was, well, the leader of the pack would say, go for fluprostin, and therefore, you know, ignore what the uh, medicinal chemist has to say. Um, now, the fact of the matter is, the way this evolved is that in his evidence in Xi, Dr. Krauss did give his evidence from the perspective of the general pharmacologist interested in treatments for glaucoma. And the appellants in their expert evidence, which was exchanged, blind, said no, the common general knowledge was of a prostaglandin specialist, someone who has this expertise in this particular narrow field, which meant it was more likely, as a judge found, that they would have come across fluprostanol in a particular context. And what then happened is Dr. Krauss, in his reply evidence, took the various assumptions about how fluprostanol would be found and what would be thought about fluprostanol and the assumptions in his reply. And he dealt with the, each of Dr. Wilson's comments in chief seriatim. And if a court would take tab four of the supplemental bar. And go to 74.3, well actually a tab four. Can I pick it up at 25? Um, he says, a paragraph 56 of his first report, Dr. Wilson states, the skilled pharmacologist would have referred to the table of tips supplement and Coleman classification as a matter of course. In my opinion, the skill fungus would have used the table in tips and publication scheme to look up selective FP 
antagonist. Agonist. I address both the tips of and the column further below. However, and indeed, this is how Dr. Wilson got to fluprostanol. It was referred to in a particular tip supplement, and he said you'd look it up and you'd see fluprostanol. And then what Dr. Krauss said in reply, the bottom two lines, he says, even if, even if the defendant's skilled pros prostaglandin pharmacologist would have been aware of the Coleman classification from their common general knowledge, which as I said, I don't think they would, there would be no cause for them to look up or take special note. Yeah, but the judge found otherwise. Pardon? The judge found the contrary. He, he did, but that, that was, but he, nevertheless, he was, he, the evidence here, and I think I was going to come to paragraph 20, um, now the judge did find that fluprostanol, and this led to the, the, the question of the, what was known about fluprostanol. So, so the judge dealt with this at both levels. First of all, he found it was common general knowledge. Secondly, he said you would follow up reference 56 in any event, and then you would find it that way, even if you didn't know about it already. Yes. Yes, I, I, I agree. But then... When we come to obviousness over stern chance, this is dealt with at page 60 of the bundle, page 24 of the report. And what he did was um, at the end of 74, he says, I address each of the steps that Dr. Wilson appears to rely on his first report in reaching the conclusion he does. And he summarizes it for the following. And then he takes in 74.1 the Tanaprost promising new treatment. The potency data shows that the Tanaprost is a potent and selective agent. And 74.3 that the observed lowering of IOP, lack of ocular rotation, reduced hyperemia due to the Tanaprost being potent and selective. And he dis disagrees with that, says you just can't reach that conclusion. Yeah, but to be clear, as I understand it, the key point you're relying upon here is that this is all premised on approaching it through the eyes of what he calls the defendant skilled prostaglandin pharmacologist. In other words, assuming against himself that the skilled person is as characterised by the defendants. Yeah, that's just so. And, and that, that, that's the qu <laughs> much better and shorter way of saying it. Yes, he did give his evidence in reply on the basis of the prostaglandin <coughs> specialist view of the common general knowledge. <coughs> So the idea that Dr. Krauss's evidence was only given on the basis of a generalist and not on a prostaglandin specialist simply does not just hold water. And, and again, he was he was he was cross-examined uphill and down dale on that. Uh, and again, we, we give the evidence references in paragraphs 95 to 97 of our, our skeleton, and he he actually stuck to his guns. I don't think it would be profitable just to show the court that that's the case. Uh, again, if my own friend wants to show where he buckled in any way, then she can do so, but he didn't. Uh, and that evidence was all, was all given. Now, then, can I just make a comment on the patent? My own friend took the court through it. But what my own friend didn't mention is that the judge accepted, and there's no appeal, against what the alleged technical contribution of the patent was in paragraphs 119 to 122 of the judgment. And it was a new and useful therapy for the treatment of glaucoma, the anticipation attack failing. Secondly, it was a prostaglandin analog that lowered IOP without the hyperemia associated with PGF2 alpha, and it was an analog which is better than latanoprost in terms of IOP lowering, but with comparable good acceptable hyperemic properties. And the significance is that it wasn't being advanced as part of the technical contribution in respect of, of, of irritation specifically, because it's always been common ground that there are no data specifically uh, in respect of irritation. But when one sees the case law, and I'm considering here generics and Yader in particular, which the appellants cite in their skeleton of paragraph 41.1 on page 11, a technical effect which is not rendered plausible may not be taken into account in assessing inventive step. And in that respect, that's, that's right. Uh, and the judge didn't do so, as is clear from the judgment, the paragraph 173. Well, I think we need to come back to this when we come on to the question of, of insufficiency. I think that's right. But, but just to put down a marker for when you do, the starting point for Ms Lane's case 
is that there's an inherent contradiction um, between uh, when you view it from the perspective of insufficiency between the fact that you didn't argue that there's any technical contribution in addressing the side effect of ocular irritation because you accept that there's no data to support that on the one hand and on the other hand a claim which covers absence of that side effect. I will come back to that in the context of the insufficiency argument. I, I, I hear the argument and I have several answers to it. Can, yeah. I, can I perhaps deal with the rest of the um, obviousness aspects first sure. and then, then come back to that? Now, the first alleged error in reading Stjernshans is regards the passage set up by the judge in paragraph 151. And it's the same passage, whether one takes it from Sternschanz itself, which is at 696, uh, core 14. Sorry to be using the original numbers. It's at page 170 at the top. And it says, the analogues exhibiting least conjunctival, conjunctival hyperemia were generally those exhibiting least pharmacologic activities, such as the earlier mentioned 15 hydroxy epimers and, and such as, and he refers to those. Now, what the judge did not do is what my learned friend suggests in her skeleton, is to say that there was some absolute correlation, that they went hand in hand. That's paragraph 152. Sorry. Uh, and they say it's not correct. One assumes factually the two go hand in hand. And they uh, say the judge overlooked the word generally. And we have several answers to this argument. First, it's what the passage in the paper says in terms. It says the analogues exhibiting least hyperemia were generally those exhibiting the least activity. There was no misreading of the judge. He didn't misconstrue it as such. And as we reference in paragraph 50 of our, this is the second answer, is actually the evidence was that the conclusions based in the paper would have been based on more data than are actually in the paper itself. And we give the references in paragraph 50. We know that Dr. Sternchance was publishing more analogues in, in his other paper and, and therefore he had a, would have been assumed to have had a bigger database in the world at large than with what's printed here and third the judge's conclusion was one he was entitled to come to correctly on the cross-examination that's quoted in our skeleton on paragraph 49 and my learned friend has actually taken you to these but perhaps I can just for convenience take it from our skeleton Right, just before we get into the cross-examination, as Ms. Lane made clear in her submissions this morning, a sheet anchor on this point is what Dr. Krauss said in his first report, paragraph 138. Yes, I come... And Dr. Krauss, as a good scientist, has taken the statement in the paper and asked himself, is it backed by the, uh, by the data? And his answer is no, that's the submission. Well, what he actually said, and I'm going to go, this is, I was going to deal with this in just a minute. Can, can I deal with it in just a second, my lord, or can I? What? Can I deal with I've got a section on Dr. Krauss. So I think the All difference right. in a nutshell is the fact that Dr. Krauss, I was dealing with the disclosure of the paper. What does the paper actually say? And then the question is, what would the scientist who chose to investigate the data uh, well, make of it. We can see what the paper says, and the witnesses all, all agreed that the sentence says what the sentence says, as you would expect. And it, it, it wasn't perfect. But the fact of the matter is the judge gave it the right weight. Because the judge at 152, in the passage we've seen, says the passage, quotes, gives the impression that hyperemia was in some way correlated with activity. And there's no doubt that it does, in fact, give that impression.
that, that was at uh, paragraph 152 of the judgment. And he doesn't, in a sense, crank it up any greater than mm. paragraph 152. He just says it would reduce any confidence. He doesn't say it would destroy the confidence. It gives that impression and simply reduces it. And then at 177.6, You know, as part of part of his overall assessment, he says, although Sternchan's results in relation to the side effects of irritation were very good, the position on hyper was much less clear. True. And there was an indication that the better the effect, the greater the hyperemia. It's hard to progress, see how to progress from there. I mean, again, it says an indication. And of course, bear in mind, Sternchan's is the pleaded prior art, which is what alleged to make the invention obvious. And, you know, Sternchan's you know, was a respected scientist and made that observation. Now, Dr. Krauss was always keen to say, you know, was, was very, very particular and very careful. But so far as the, the average scientist reading that paper, as Dr. Redshaw and Dr. Wilson accepted, it does give that impression. And when the judge says an impression, an indication, he's not saying it's absolute. He's not saying that it's clear. And that, when I said I, I come to, to um, uh, when one sees generally, um, that, that's as far as it went. And the fifth point I was going to make on this is that it can be seen, for example, that on, on, if one takes Jernshans again, compounds five and eight are the most active. And one sees this on page 166. One sees, for example, compound 5 and compound 8 at the dose of 0.1 micrograms per mole, uh, we get minus 5. 8 had a very similar result at 0.3 micrograms uh, per mole. And if one then looks at the table 2, I don't think you mean table two, that's all about the partition coefficient. So table one. One sees that they had at 1.5 and 1.3 the higher um, ocular surface hyperemia. So generally, I think you probably don't read too much into this. That is a, a fair statement. Now, so far as Dr. Krauss was concerned, he did say the skilled pharmacologist would conclude there was no clear correlation between the observed hyperemia in the different analogues tested. So that's as far as he went, and one doesn't want to overstate uh, uh, that. And then he says he went on to state, and this is paragraph 138 of the statement, that based on the lack of correlation between IOP layer and hyperemia, the skilled pharmacologist would conclude that the biological mechanism for the hyperemia was unclear. So even if you assume that he's taking a, a, a and see that he's taking a stricter view of it, he's still ending up in a position that in fact it doesn't suggest that hyperemia is due to discrimination between different receptor subtypes. You're, you're left in no better position. So the position is again unclear. But bear in mind that it was the position that we've seen in the evidence, that the appellants experts were saying, oh, provided it's, it's you know, FP selective, you know, you're okay. But the, what this is showing is actually with hyperemia, that's not so clear at all. Yes, irritation we see from table one is resolved with those compounds, but not the hyperemia. And it, it goes on to explain why, why that is so. That's the first alleged error. It's not a misreading of Sternschatz. It would have been had to be a different attack altogether. Uh, if the appellants wanted to take this point, they would have had to say the, the, skilled, uh, the skilled expert would not take this at face value, would analyze the data, and conclude that you are in a good place. But of course, they couldn't do that because 
even if you analyse the data the way Krauss did, they're still in a bad place with high premium. So it doesn't actually, I think Lord Justice Arnold said this morning, well, where does it get you? It doesn't actually get the appellants into a better place. So, um, again, that's a, another cul de sac in the argument. Now, the second alleged error reading Schoenschatz is said to relate his reading of the penultimate paragraph. <coughs> and this is on page uh, 174. And it explains why it thinks that the reduction of ocular side effects is probably due to the conformational change in the omega chain in the prostaglandin molecule, steric hindrance, which enables a discrimination between different prostaglandin receptor subtypes. The most optimal chain which the ring structures attach seems to be five carbon atoms, 17 phenyl, 18, 19, 10 tetrinyl. The biological activity of these compounds may be further altered by substitutions in the phenyl ring. Now, again, I showed the court this morning how Dr. Kavala read that. <coughs> is basically the way we say it's logically to be read, namely, here we are, go or go forth and try more. And in fact, what the way my learned friend this morning tried to get round that was to say, oh, well, it's just a statement of work that's been done. And she pointed to page 173, the effects of substituents on the, on the phenyl ring. But actually, when you read what it goes on to say at 173 bottom right hand side from what is mentioned above it's evident that by substituting part of the omega chain of PGF with a phenyl ring it's possible to totally eliminate the ocular irritating effect okay, and, to, and to markedly reduce the hyperemic effect of PGF2 alpha. Although a phenyl ring substitution seems to be particularly beneficial substitution with other ring structures such as cyclohexyl, thiophenyl, and biphenyl also yields compounds with distinctly better side effects. Well, why is that relevant? That's, as it says, it's all about different ring structures. I mean, well, surely the relevant paragraph is the following one. Well, uh, indeed. Other phenyl substituted products, others have been studied in which respect to positive. Yes, it is obvious similar phenyl substitutions can be anticipated ana analogously to improve the side effect profile of these prostaglandin analogs in the oh. area. Not saying they've actually been done, but saying it's to be anticipated that they, you can make similar compounds. And, they, and that basically that is what the conclusion is harking back to, is to say, look, there are things that you can do. And the reason to answer my Lord Daughter's answer the question of why, why is it relevant is because you know, one would basically take latanoprost as being the best so far and then make these changes to try to build on the best, whether it's in terms of the identity of the ring where it seems to be particularly beneficial, although phenyl substitution, other ring structures yields compounds distinctly better side effects. And, and that's why, when you actually uh, look at this, they, they, the appellants criticise the judge at 100 and, uh, it's, um, 181 to 182 of the judgment in saying, in my view, the natural way for the skilled team to approach obvious developments from Jernshans would be to consider further prostaglandin development analogs altered in ways concretely reasoned out from the structural activity work to This would be logical and routine in keeping with the approach of the paper. It is suggested in the penultimate paragraph of the paper. Well, in my respectful submission, I, I can't see what else it's saying. It's not saying this work's been done. Jernshans is saying, here is work to be done. Well, they've uh, done some work, but they're not pretending it's comprehensive. They, yeah, absolutely. They're saying, look, these are, these are avenues. And no structure activity relationship is really ever complete. There's always more of a direction you can go in. And Dr. Kavala uh, was clear about that. And this is where Dr. Kavala and his evidence, and we quote it in paragraph 63 of our skeleton, where he said, I'm just pointing out they're bread and butter is structural variation. The way you go is by modifying the tanoprost rather than shifting over to a different area entirely and expecting the transfer of all those properties into a different species, different roots, different tissue. And we get another quote at from day three, four twenty at the top on paragraph sixty-three of our skeleton. 
It's what the medicinal chemist always does. Vary the molecule, test exactly the same models that we use. In other words, effect on people's diameter, effect of hyperemia, and see whether I can get a better compound uh, than the tannin. So the, the, the problem, as I say, with Dr. Redshaw's evidence as a medicinal chemist, is she had no analysis of this whatsoever. Um, and, and the judge was right to say, you know, where you have a case that the use of fluprostanol is the heart and centre of the case, not to have provided any such rational explanation is, 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 is wrong. And the judge held at 176 that although he said this was not an obviousness over CGK case alone, he said that the defendant's attack was developed at a considerably greater level of simplicity and generality than either Sternschatz or the common general knowledge justified. And there is no challenge to that finding. It's not suggested that he was wrong to so hold. It was just, just very superficial. In fact, it was conclusory, it wasn't it, superficial. And Dr. Kavala, uh, Dr. Krauss, in his evidence, and this was paragraph 234 of Krauss, did actually say that the skilled pharmacologist might discuss the possibility of investigating phenyl substituted analogues for PGF2 alpha. And the reason he wouldn't have gone down that is to say, well, it wouldn't be thought that it would be possible to produce a compound with improved characteristics. And I showed the court when I started reading the extracts from the evidence in chief uh, that, in fact, Dr. Redshaw and Dr. Uh, Wilson, Professor Wilson were not saying that they wouldn't consider making structural variations. I can just give the two paragraph numbers that I gave previously. It was paragraph 73 of Dr. Redshaw and it was paragraph 147 of Dr. Will Professor Wilson. So it wasn't as though discussing, considering structural variation wasn't part of the uh, 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 agenda. And Dr. Kavala, indeed, in the evidence that my own friend showed the court this morning, in, in fact, went into what you could have done if you just thought that you could improve or try to come up with improve all the variations that you might go down. And his evidence was there was obviously there was nothing that would actually teach you what would be a better compound, and certainly nothing that would get you to fluprostanol, and certainly nothing uh, that would be uh, a step forward. In other words, there was no obvious way forward. It wasn't, my little friend's case is predicated on the basis that if you didn't make, if you didn't think it was obvious to make structural variations, ergo, it must have been obvious to go to fluprostanol. But as I've said to the court, that's not right. The actual evidence was going to fluprostanol was not straightforward. And both the medicinal chemist, Dr. Kavala, disagreed with was straightforward in his reply evidence. That's paragraph 38 at tab 3. And Dr. Krauss, we've seen the evidence in paragraph 74, he disagreed too that it was straightforward. And in fact, the evidence of Dr. Kavala was the most straightforward was actually to make the variations. But that wasn't something that was, was obvious, obvious to him. So. Uh, that is another uh, cul-de-sac, so far as that evidence was concerned. Can I, can I just check that I've actually referred the court to two evidence references in this respect, which are at uh, Supplemental Tab 10. I fear I may have done, but I just want to check. This is uh, Tab 10. Three, four and six to four one nine. Yes, I did I did show the call this. And also at day three, four twenty two to four twenty three. Yes, you've dealt with the So I yeah. So 
it's not a case that, well, if, if it's not obvious to look at structural variations, then it must be obvious to go to two cross. That brings me to, I've dealt with the, ins, the expert evidence that I want to, um, the appeal on insufficiency. Um, we explain in our skeleton, uh, paragraph 105 onwards, that there was no freestanding allegation of insufficiency, and it was a very precise and narrowly framed squeeze which was that the claims of the patent are not obvious because, quote, it was understood that administration of PGF to a isoprovestor would cause hyperemia and irritation. The patent fails to make plausible the compounds are suitable for use in treating glaucoma and ocular hypertension. In, other, in particular, the data in the specification fails to have been proven in these side effects when the compounds of the invention are used over PGF to alpha isoprovestor. These side effects presumably being both. Now, it was not the defence to obviousness that the skilled person wouldn't go to fluprostanol because of the likelihood of irritation. There was no independent, freestanding defence. That wasn't the defence to obviousness that was being advanced. And it's, it's the quid pro quo in that respect. That if you're going to say that your inventive contribution, for example, and what was not obvious was irritation, and you have to back that up. But I've shown the court what the three technical contributions were in 122, and we weren't saying that irritation specifically was the, 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 the contribution, and it's clear from generics and Yeda that we would have been unwise to do so, because it says if it's not plausible, you're not allowed to. But where effects are plausible, you can do so. And the reason that the squeeze was framed as narrowly and as specific as it was, it was because the appellants were running a case that PGF2-alpha was suitable for the treatment and the use of glaucoma, despite the fact there were no data whatsoever in the prior art citation, which was called EP800, alleged to anticipate the patent to render anything plausible. It's clear from the judge's reasoning, and when we see the reasoning in the patent, that the claims of the patent were not found to be obvious on the basis because it was understood that PGF2-alpha would cause hyperemia and irritation. That's not the way the attack was advanced, nor was it the way the attack was defended. And for that reason alone, the so-called squeeze argument doesn't arise the way it was pleaded. And we submit that when you've actually made a specific pleading choice, where there's... Uh, you know, for the first time you decide to do this. And of course, they then fail on their anticipation argument. It's not right to enable a party to turn around and basically broaden up what is effectively a freestanding <coughs> insufficiency argument, that it's not plausible, that there is uh, an overcoming of the effect of irritation. Can you just briefly remind me, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there was a case of anticipation trial, which of course is no longer being pursued on appeal, but can you remind me what the case was? What the, it was over at EP 200. Right, so it was a different anticipation by a different piece of paper. It was a novelty only citation, yeah. and it was bereft of any data, but it was said that all the compounds there, which included PGF to alpha, were plausible uh, for the treatment of glaucoma. Uh, the judge deals with it in the judgment. Yes, I'm just looking at it now. All right, I, I remember. Thank you. So we submit it's illegitimate for a party to come and broaden up its uh, effective alleged squeeze. Um, and that, for that reason alone, we say it, it, it doesn't arise. Um, furthermore, there is no requirement that the patent evinces an improvement in the side effects over PGF to alpha. And also, what the appellants are saying, in its appellant skeleton at 81, and I think it was reflected in the oral submissions, was that a compound is not suitable for treatment if it causes irritation. The judge didn't make any findings to that effect, and the position is not that absolute by any means. The actual findings of the judge 
in paragraphs 123 to 127, was he said that the issue was whether or not there comes a point where the combined effects are so bad that the drug is not suitable for use despite having an effect on the disease in question. And he says, to quote, the boundary must depend on context, the disease state, including its severity, the nature and effect of the side effect. Now the judge held that the specific side effect profile of PGF2-alpha, ocular irritation, hyperemia, and hyperemia, at the level they occur, was such that PDF-alpha was not suitable for use in treating glaucoma. But beyond that, the judge made no findings as to the precise boundary of either ocular irritation or hyperemia, still less in combination. Reduced hyperemia may permit a higher level of ocular irritation and vice versa. And thus, this is not to criticise the judge, it's just it simply wasn't an issue before the court specifically as to what level of irritation would render a drug unsuitable for use. For example, Timolol, which was the gold standard in terms of IOP reduction and the drug of first choice, caused ocular irritation. That's Dr. Krause's uh, evidence, paragraph 49, his first report, at page 20 of tab 2 of the supplemental bundle. So some, some level of irritation was acceptable. But the problem here is that given there was no freestanding allegation of insufficiency based on lack of data re regarding ocular irritation, then the appellant shouldn't be permitted to advance that one now. And had there been such a case directed specifically to uh, meet that case, then the claimant would have adduced evidence of the acceptable levels of ocular irritation that could be tolerated <coughs> in the absence of unacceptable uh, hyperemia. So uh, because it was run as a squeeze, these avenues have not been explored. And it's just wrong. When my little friend said, he put, she put it so starkly in her submissions this morning, she said, you really don't want ocular irritation. Well, it's just not that black and white. Because as I say, Timolol had ocular irritation, but it was used as the gold standard. And that's the danger of ripping this allegation out from the squeeze. And the problem uh, with the, the, the defendant's closing uh, submissions that were advanced uh, this morning, paragraph 96 onwards, is, first of all, and I remember this uh, uh, starkly, is, is that the criticism we made of this was that it just wasn't the pleaded squeeze argument which is what the judge directed his arguments to. And it's, it's morphed in the paragraph 96 from the pleading about if it's not obvious because of PGF to alpha, then it follows. That was the pleaded squeeze. 96 becomes if side, if side effect sparing is a limitation in the claim, then the pattern doesn't render it plausible. Well, this is just away from the pleading. And furthermore, it says there, are, there is no data which ocular irritation has been tested. Well, that's what it says. And then as to hyperemia, as to efficacy. So it was all bundled together as irritation, hyperemia, and efficacy. And, and this just didn't fly. And you know, if one again gets to the three bullet points at paragraph 100, it's not possible to tell whether fluproxenol causes irritative side effects which are a principal concern to the skilled person. You are basically coming to a different case altogether than that which the respondents went to court to meet, and we say did meet, and which the judge so held in our favour. So, unless I can assist the court further, those are my responses. Thank you very much indeed. Anything in reply? Uh, I do have a few points um, in reply. Certainly. My lords. Um, first of all, in relation to fluprostanol, um, my learned friend made great play of the fact that he said the evidence didn't show um, that the skilled person would even think of fluprostanol. Uh, and in my submission, there uh, certainly was sufficient evidence to support um, that the skilled person would think of fluprostanol. And I'm just going to go through that very quickly. I think I've taken uh, my lords and my lady to it already, but just 
bring it all together in one place. First of all, I remind you that the skilled pharmacologist is looking for a biological target. We saw that in the evidence right at the beginning about the nature of the skilled team and the different roles. And um, then at paragraph 176 of the judgment, uh, we saw the judge's finding that Sternschanz contains concrete identification of the FP receptor involvement uh, with IOP lowering. And then, in addition to that, we obviously have the CGK finding at paragraph uh, 94 that fluprostanol is CGK and that it's a highly potent FP receptor agonist, um, but a very selective, so uh, essentially nil activity against other uh, receptor types. Uh, in addition, if a um, skilled person doesn't know that, then uh, we have the judge's finding at 154 that the skilled person would actually look up the Coleman reference, and that's, um, it, I took my lady and my lords for that this morning, it was reference 56, or I took, took my lady and my lords for the passage that referred to it, and um, so we have all those findings, and uh, with those uh, things in mind, the skilled person, uh, knowing that uh, FP receptor um, involvement was important, um, would um, have cause to think of uh, fluprostanol. And uh, I think we've been to the evidence references already of uh, my witnesses, and we've been to um, the evidence reference of Dr. Kabbalah, but there was an evidence reference of Dr. Krauss um, which was put on a series of assumptions, but I would just like to turn up uh, very quickly so that um, the court has everything on the point. And that is T3, page 472, and it's in uh, tab 9 of the supplemental bundle. Sorry, this, that's a wrong reference, uh, but it was something that I want to look at and I haven't looked at or mentioned yet. On page 472, that's page 131 of the bundle, um, this is Dr. Krauss saying that um, at lines 12 to 16, in the specific prostaglandin literature, fluprostanol and cloprostanol are repeatedly mentioned. I think that is the point you're trying to make here, because those were actually pretty much the only two compounds that were available for the FP receptor at the time. And then if we move uh, forward to... Um, the same uh, bundle uh, but pages, transcript pages 549 which is at page uh, 150 of the bundle and um, if I could just ask my lady and my lord to read uh, pa page 549 line 5 all the way down to page 551 uh, line 5 where um, the question is put on the assumption uh, about um, the hypothesis um, relating to FB, FB receptors being a good one. Uh, and um, in that context, then um, the witness accepts that, um, uh, that it would be worth putting into the primate model. And that, that bit of evidence is really just at the bottom of page 550, lines 24, to page 551, line 5. Yes, so there's, there's a concrete finding. We've already mentioned the concrete finding in the judgment. Which is the basis for this, this assumption that we're putting the question on. Um, in particular, uh, we had some discussion this morning um, 
about in the context of the overall direction of uh, stern shanks in line two. And, uh, I think my learned friend uh, mentioned this paragraph. And um, I uh, put the point this morning uh, that that was a reference back to 1865, um, although it's possible it could be referring to other things. And in my submission, the other thing that it um, is likely to be referring to is paragraph 181, um, that is the um, approach that the skilled team would take to obvious developments from stern shanks. You took and, us and to that this morning. You took us to that this oh, morning. I, I'm grateful, my lady. Um, it feels like it's been a long day. <laughs> well, I'm sure it does. Um, and I just wanted to um, make the point at 188 as well. The last sentence, much more attractive options consistent with the overall teaching and direction of stern shanks were available. We say, obviously, that's wrong because there was no ed evidential basis. And um, that um, it is uh, the error two uh, point. And I'm going to come back to that shortly. Uh, but before I do that, my learned friend relied on some evidence from Dr. Cavalla um, in relation to um, obviousness and in particular uh, his second report at Supplemental Bundle Tab 3, uh, paragraphs 36 and 37. And um, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Arnold put the point, and of course I do make this point, that this is the evidence of the medicinal chemist. Uh, but in addition to that, um, there is um, uh, the point that um, what, what's being done uh, here by the medicinal chemist is trying to assess if the pharmacological profile would change. But of course, we know the pharmacological profile of uh, fluprostanol uh, from the CGK. Uh, and um, indeed, um, the other point to make here is that... Uh, Sorry, I don't understand that. I mean, it was known that it was... <clears throat> Um, active against the FP receptor and selective for that receptor. Do you mean anything more by it than that? Because, I mean, the phrase pharmacological profile could be understood as extending rather further. No, no, I don't mean anything more than what, what my Lord uh, just said. And um, the, the other point is that this evidence is done uh, on the basis of the question of whether it would be more efficacious or potent. And um, my lady and my Lord will appreciate that our case is just whether it is an obvious um, thing to try, not whether or not it's the most obvious. We don't need to put our case that high in order to succeed. Um, and, and that is also our answer to the evidence of Dr. Krauss in his second report, which uh, my learned friend took you to at tab four, paragraph 74.5 and 74.4 and 74.5 at pages 61 and 62, um, what is being considered uh, by the expert here is whether it's better in terms of efficacy, uh, and uh, indeed, as I've already pointed out, whether it's the first thing you try at paragraph 76, not whether it's one obvious route to try. Now, um, moving quickly on, and I don't have many points left, um, to error one. Um, that is the error in reading uh, stern chance. Um, I, I detected that perhaps my learned friend was trying to suggest that Dr. Krause's evidence um, at paragraph uh, 137 and 138 could be put on one side on the basis that he was too skilled and too careful. Uh, but in fact, it is clear from the wording of that evidence that it, what he is saying there is on the basis of what the skilled pharmacologist would uh, say. So that is the unchallenged evidence on the basis of the skilled pharmacologist. Uh, and my learned friend said at one point, provided you don't read too much into it, and he was talking about the um, paragraph of Stern Chance that's cited in uh, paragraph 151 of the judgment, then it's a fair statement. Well, our point, of course, is that the judge did read far too much into it and in particular at paragraph 1865. Now, um, looking now at the second error, uh, and that's the, um, well, it's got two aspects, 
to it. There's the fact that we say that there is no evidence to support um, the judge's finding um, that you would look at further compounds with the stern chance. And there is also uh, the point in the penultimate paragraph of stern chance itself at page 174. And I would just ask um, it, my lady and my lords to turn up stern chance one more time. The last time, uh, tab 14, let's have a look at that conclusion, penultimate paragraph, last line, which we rely on. The biologic activity of these compounds may further be altered by substitutions in the phenyl ring. We say these compounds is a reference back to the previous sentence. The most optimal chain length to which the ring structure is attached seems to be five carbon atoms. 17 phenyl, blah, blah, blah. We say that these compounds is a reference back to that particular sentence, and that is taking us to um, the previous page, um, effects of substituents on the phenyl ring. It is not taking us, and, and you can see that from just immediately under the heading on page 173, uh, biological effects of different substituents on the benzene ring of 17 phenyl, blah, blah, blah. And so that is why we say that this sentence is a reference back to that page, and it's not a reference back to um, the text under the heading on page 174, other phenyl substituted prostaglandin analogs. Well, I understand why you say it's a reference to work that's been done. Yes. But why do you say that it is not suggesting further work as well? Well... My Lord, in my submission, what this is, is the conclusion section of the paper, and it is summing up the work that has been done in the paper. I mean, it's not saying go off and do other work, because we haven't done a very good job. I mean, it's saying look at all the work we've done, and um, referring back to the previous to be sure, page. Of course, of course they're summarising their work they've done, and of course they're drawing conclusions. The question on obviousness is what is suggested to the skilled reader, <coughs> yes. in this case, the skilled team of readers. So the question then is, do they read that sentence and think, the investigation of structure activity relationship <coughs> that's been carried out here is exhaustive, and there's nothing more to be done? Or do they think, they've done a certain amount of work, but there is room for further investigation? Now, why do they think, on your submission, that it's exhausted? Well, two things. First of all, because, as I say, this is a reference back to the previous work, but also, more importantly, perhaps, because of <coughs> the expert evidence of my learned friend's own witnesses that said, we just do what's in stern chance, uh, and I think I did go to this earlier. Um, it says we don't investigate further uh, structural work, uh, activity relationship work because Stern Chance has done it all already and it would be far too complicated. So that was the evidence I did, I did take, uh, I think, my lady and my lords to. Um, and I believe the evidence references are in our skeleton arguments somewhere. Um, and they just say, we do what's in Stern Chance. Yes, it's Dr. Krause's evidence for um, your note uh, at, in his first report, paragraphs 234 to 238. Yes, so in particular, two, sorry, 239, in particular 239, I therefore do not believe a skilled pharmacologist would be motivated to investigate other female substituted amyloids. So, so this is our point, that the judge got it wrong completely on the evidence, and and we pray in aid that he got that last sentence wrong, which he referred to in paragraph 181. And finally, uh, insufficiency. Um, what I understood my learned friend to be doing at, at this stage in the game was taking a pleading point. Um, I don't actually understand the pleading point because our pleading clearly refers to both hyperemia and irritation. And it seemed as though the upshot of his submission was somehow 
that there wasn't a reference to irritation in our pleading. There is a reference to irritation that's set out in the judgment. And um, it is a squeeze. I, I accept that. Um, my learned friend, I don't think, dealt with our point that the judge got the law wrong um, because he didn't look at um, what um, it means to say that the invention works. Uh, and so, um, as I've already indicated, the invention working must include the fact that it doesn't have a side effect of irritation. He made the point that the judge didn't make a finding as to this precise boundary of irritation. Uh, we say that doesn't matter in this case because there's absolutely no data about irritation in the patent at all. So it doesn't matter what the precise uh, boundary is. Uh, and so in my submission, the uh, Allcom simply didn't deal um, with our point about the judge's error of law uh, in, in arriving at a conclusion where he just didn't deal with irritation uh, when he came to consider uh, plausibility. <laughs> I, I finished, um, my lady, my lords, unless you have any further questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, can I thank you all very much and uh, the whole considerable teams, um, both the lawyers and the scientists that I know are all, all here and have um, put together um, this very technical matter with considerable skill for which we're all, certainly, I'm very grateful. Lord or Justice Arnold, probably less so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm In grateful too. <laughs> um, so you won't be surprised at all to hear that we're going to reserve our judgments. Um, I can't give you a precise time when they will be handed uh, down at this stage. They'll be sent out in the normal way uh, for typographical, um, for minor factual and other errors, but uh, not to relitigate. Um, I'd hope that you might be able to agree any other orders arising, but we'll deal with all those matters on the paper if you're now going to agree subsequent to orders of this. Uh, so, um, unless there's anything else that we need to deal with, thank you all very much indeed.